Bengals are three and a half point favorites, one and four, hosting our two and three Giants. The last time these two teams met, 2020, where Brandon Allen started for the injured Joe Burrow. The Giants won that game. As I like to go over my history, Cincinnati leads the old time series six to five, but the Giants have won the last two meetings. And the last two years, they've played the Cincinnati Bengals. They've had pretty good second half of the season. So definitely intrigued about that. Uh, Bengals are 0-4 all time on the road against the Giants. Um, and the one last thing, brutal overtime loss last week to Baltimore. They are starving for a win, Johnny. Their season is on the brink. Yeah, that – you know, they are – one, this whole year is hard to put into words, Tom, and I think it really – the Bengals are a prime example of that. I mean, you know, they lose – they looked awful against the Patriots week one, but this team, when you look at it, is good enough to be two and three, three and two, and instead they're one and four. You know, the coaching has been suspect. The defense has been awful. The offensive line, which – Joe Burrow has not had an offensive line at all since he's been an NFL quarterback. It's it's criminal what that organization has done not to protect him. But, you know, really this is not about Joe Burrow because if you watch the game Sunday, I mean, that was one of his best games of – you almost could say one of his best games of his career. You know, you're getting – obviously these two big guys, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase involved. By the way, going to have a lot of LSU uh, in this game Sunday night. But, yeah, and – you know, it's just it, – it's it's really crazy. You know, the one saving grace probably for the Bengals is the fact that they've only played one game in division. It's not like last year when they started out 0-2 and, and both of those losses were in division and then Joe Burrow obviously gets hurt. Joe Burrow actually looks healthy, which I think is a great thing. But, uh, yeah, this is really – I mean, when you speak of, you know, desperation, and it's something I've used a lot when I made my football picks this year on social media, uh, I've looked at teams that are desperate – in these kind of matchups. And to me, the Bengals are definitely the more desperate team going into this game Sunday night for sure. And, you know, I, I got to think that, you know, T Higgins and Jamar Chase are going to have an impact in this game. I think very, you know, at the start, you're looking at, you know, can this Giants defense continue to pressure, pressure the quarterback? And I think they certainly can because we know this offensive line for the Bengals is not that good. No, they're not. Left to right, it's – Orlando Brown, Cordell Volson, Ted Karras, Alex Kappa, and first-round rookie Amarius Mims. So there are growing pains there. Going up against Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence, and possibly no Kayvon Thibodeau this week. It would be Aziz Ojolari, who, in my opinion, when healthy, is starting material, but he's never been healthy his first three-plus years in the National Football League. Yeah. Aziz um, is the key. Give you another interesting nugget about this game, too. So in the last three weeks, the Bengals have have scored 35 points per game, which is second best in the league. They're allowing 34.3 per game. So That's a lot. Yeah, I mean, could you see? I, I you know the, and I'm probably bringing this up a couple of times here before the end of the night. I, the Giants don't play many shootout kind of games, so I don't know if this game's going to become a shootout, but. The Bengals could make this shootout because of how porous their defense is, but I don't know how that if that's going to benefit the Giants or not because they have not played many shootouts the last several years. I mean, it's definitely been before this regime for, for, for sure. For sure. Yeah, look, there's a lot of desperation. Neither of these teams has won a home game yet this year either, so benefit, I guess, road team based off that. I, I, I wish this game was in – you know, call me crazy when I say this. I wish this game was in Cincinnati because if, if the one thing we've seen with this with this organization, and this even goes back to the two Super Bowl runs, you put them out on the road, they seem a lot more comfortable out on the road than they do at home. I, I don't know what it is. You know, going to Seattle, maybe one of the best things for them was to get away from all the craziness and go out west. I, I think we've seen that actually with a couple of teams this year, getting away from the, from home and going out on the road, getting away from it all. Uh yeah, so that's so obviously it starts with that. I think what we spoke about just a couple of minutes ago with Tracy and Devin Singletary, 
the Bengals, not only the defense bad, they can't stop the run. I would expect – I think the, I think you're going to see a lot of running from this Giants team. I mean, I think you could even see easily see 100-plus yards between Tracy or, and or Singletary. It depends if, if Singletary is going to be uh, active for this game. I know that Malik Neighbors is trending in the right direction, the reports have been. Uh, I'm not sure the status about Singletary just yet, but – I, I would be surprised if you're the, if we don't see the Giants rush for over 100 yards here on Sunday night. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk about it. And before we get into our keys of the game, we have a very special guest. And, uh, Sam actually told me about her, uh, Johnny. So I want to bring her up here. Well, the, Sam says it must be a good guest then. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Sam always uh, refers me to great people. Let's bring her up. Uh, New York Giants fangirl Adriana joins the show. Welcome, Adriana. Hello. Great to see you. Thank you guys for having me. Of course, of course. So I want to, first off, learn a little bit more about you. I've been following your work for maybe a couple weeks now. And uh, my co-host, Sam, who couldn't be here tonight, I'm here with Johnny, who's just as awesome. Um, <laughs> Where can people find your work? And can you tell a little bit about our fans, the work that you do regarding the Giants content wise? Yeah, so I um, I grew up a Giants fan. My grandfather was a Giants season ticket holder. So whole family, diehard Giants fans, some of us more so than others. Um, and I have lived in different areas where sometimes I've not been able to watch the Giants on TV. So my husband and I moved to Connecticut in end of 2020, you know, when Joe Judge was doing his Joe Judge type of thing. And I have a group chat, you know, with some of my insane family members where we were just back and forth all day about the Giants and like what was going on and and that whole sort of thing. And I, I because I had recently moved to Connecticut, I was like, well, I'm in an area where I know there are other Giants fans. And previously I was living in Massachusetts. So like all of my, my husband is from there, all of his friends are Pats fans. So I'm like, now I'm with my people. I'm with Giants fans. So, but of course it's COVID. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how to connect with other Giants fans. So I started an Instagram page. It's called New York Giants Fangirl. And it's the same on um, TikTok and then Instagram or Twitter is NYG Fangirl. But I basically just started it and was like, I am losing my mind watching this Giants team. And I know that everyone else has to be feeling the same way. Like, where are my local Giants people? So it kind of just started like that. And then the more that I kind of posted and talked to other Giants fans, I kind of felt like we were all having a similar complaint. Um, aside from the fact of the team being bad, it was like, and I know I still do this, is I have to go to six different beat writers to get information from practices that only the media are at or to get injury updates or contract details or things like that. So I wanted to create a space where it was all in one place. So if you go to my Instagram, you're going to find everything. There's keys to win, injury updates, contracts, practice squad elevations, everything in one place. I just wanted to make it a good resource and place for other Giants fans that if they, you know, wanted to know who was going to be elevated this week or whether or not, you know, Tommy DeVito is going to play, they could find it all in one place. So that's how it started. And that's kind of, that's where it's at now. Oh, Tommy DeVito. Love <laughs> because I'm Italian. So Tommy D, yes. Yes. Great player. Johnny and I, big fans. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's been an interesting season. I think first football question, Johnny and I wanted to ask you. So, two and three, and not ideal, you know, being under five hundred. But mm -hmm. with the way the season started, expectations, you know, tempered a little bit. I think we're in an okay spot at the moment. Brian Dable taking over play calling. It seems like the offense has finally turned the corner a little bit, or maybe heading small footsteps in the right direction what do you attribute that to is it dable's play calling is it daniel jones is it multiple things or maybe something i didn't mention what do you think it is i think it's a mix of everything because if you look back at week one and even week two and week three you see kind of the different versions of daniel jones that we've seen over the years week one was the god-awful daniel jones that we're all like we need a quarterback. And then week two, he gets a little confidence and seems to be a little bit better. And, you know, week three, it's, it's up and down. So I think part of it is 
he feels he finally feels confident. And I don't know if it's it because now at this point, it's been almost a year since the ACL that he finally feels like he's back to normal. I don't know what it is, but I feel like he's finally got that inner confidence that we saw in 2022. So I think that's part of it. I think part of it is also Dable is seeing that the offensive line is protecting each other. Receivers are getting open. The run blocking is good. So he can run the offense the way that he wants it to be run. And I think in week Week one, we didn't really see that. I think in week two, we saw glimpses. But I think all, because all of the players are improving week after week, he's also feeling more confident because he's like, now I can do a flea flicker. Now I can have Jones attempt the 40-yard throw to Slayton. Like, now I can try these different sorts of things that either he tried and they weren't working or he just didn't try them because he didn't feel like the team was in the right place to do it. So I think it's a mix – of all of those things. Um, Cause even with the run blocking, like there's no reason why we should have had 26 yards against the Cowboys in the run game. Who's the worst run defense in the league. There's just no reason for it. So I think now they built the confidence up last week and they said, all right, we can go against a good defense. The offensive line can run block. Tyrone Tracy is a great runner. And now we can have some success, you know, in different phases of the offense. Yeah, and you, you were bringing up about 2022, and uh, this this team, minus the record, really, is reminding me a lot of the 2022 team. And it really, like you said with Daniel Jones, that it reminds me about, about him. But, you know, what's – when you look at when you look at this team so far, when you see Jones, and you, you, you were talking about how he struggled in week one, but what, what, have you, what do you make about, you know, it looks like he's getting better week over week. Mm -hmm. over week. Uh, what, what are you thinking about not only that, but also, like, this whole team reminding me of the 20 looking like the 2022 team a little bit. Yeah. My, my complaint with both teams is the drop balls still, uh -huh. because now we've got better talent at receiver. Like you cannot keep dropping the balls. It's so uh -huh. frustrating. So that is something that really desperately needs to be cleaned up. And the fumbles from the running backs too. Like you guys got to figure that out at this point in the season. Um, but I, I feel like we're seeing, the 2022 version, because last year was so god awful, but I feel like we're seeing an elevated version of that because this offensive line is better than the 2022 offensive line. I even think that Daniel Jones, where he's at right now, is playing better than he was in 22. He's starting to get past the first reads and, you know, he seems like he's processing a little bit better. And I think the biggest reason for that is that he's trusting the offensive line, which in 2022, they were OK compared to last year, but they weren't amazing. So I feel like even from then until now, for him, it, it must feel like there's a drastic change in blocking, especially when it comes to pass blocking, that he has time to settle in a little bit and make the decisions that he wants to make. And this is why, you know, there are Daniel Jones truthers out there, right? Because you see him with a line that can block and you're like, maybe he's not a terrible quarterback. Like he's good. He can make throws. He can do this. He can do that. So um, I think the offensive line was one of the biggest reasons as to why he's playing the way that he is outside of, you know, Dable and other things. But I really think for him, it's the offensive line. He's trusting what he's seeing and he's actually trusting the fact that, you know, he's got people in front of him who are blocking and he's not getting killed every three seconds. It's well said. Um, yeah. You know, you mentioned getting past that first read. Week one didn't seem like that was happening. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing, too, Johnny and I mentioned this earlier, 339 offensive snaps this year. All five offensive linemen have been on the field for every single one. Last Knock time. on wood. Yeah. I know Runyon has an illness. I don't know what it mm -hmm. is. I'm not going to speculate, but I know he missed practice today with some sort of illness. Hopefully he's okay. Yeah. And I think, too, that allows the younger players to get more reps, like your Tyrone Tracy's, your Theo Johnson's, right? Because they're not always going to be your first read. Your first read is Malik Neighbors. And in this case, the Seattle game, it'll be Darius Slayton and Wandale Robinson. And we saw that mixed and matched. We saw them split the targets neighbors would normally get. But to highlight Adriana on Tracy and Theo, two day three draft picks this year i don't want to call them most definite hits just yet but they're surely looking like it 
what yeah. sticks out to you about each of them? Well, for Theo, you know, we've heard this a lot so far this year, you know, last year, and they talk about this as a whole is the smart, tough, dependable thing, right? There's like beat it into all of us like a dead horse, but you've heard them say a lot about resiliency. And I think that Theo is a really good example of that. And I think you could say that for a lot of the players, but the reason I say Theo is because up until this point, he, I think had caught maybe 20% of the passes that had come his way and not entirely all his fault. DJ has had some really awful throws this year, but this week he went five for five. He's the only receiver out of all of them that caught every single ball that came his way. So I think that shows a lot of the fact that a, he's taking advantage of his opportunities. B he's really learned the system and he knows what he's capable of doing and C that him and Daniel Jones have some sort of rapport already, which I think is so important. And, you know, the fact that he's, he's getting open enough, he's catching the ball and he's getting some yak yardage after that makes me feel like he is really going to be a key piece to this offense. And I know there, you know, it is early on in the season, but I think, we have seen things be so awful for this team, especially in week one, that the fact that where they're at now, this is the football team that I expected them to be going into this season. I mean, I thought they were going to go 10 and seven because I felt like you've got the talent at this point, right? Like it's not 2022 where you're throwing to Richie James and Kenny Galladay. Like you've got better talent this time around on both sides of the ball. So there's no excuse if people are healthy. So I feel like we're finally getting to that point. I have a problem with Dable with the fact that it's taken five weeks for them to get there, which is another story. But, you know, Tyrone Tracy is a guy that now all I hear from Giants fans is he's got to be the starter. I've seen enough of, of motor and I get it, but I think, I think we also have to be realistic and understand who Dable is and know that he loves motor. He's not just going to sit him just because Tyrone had one good game. Um, so I would like to see a more balanced mix where 50, 50, they are splitting the snaps. I think that's fair. Um, and when motor has a little bit of a history at this point of fumbling the ball, you got to give away some of his snaps to Tracy who did nothing but good things last week. Yeah, I think it's a good. I think it's a good problem to have, especially going to play Cincinnati, who also cannot stop the run to save their their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you're talking about that, but also defensively. You know, this defense so far has played remarkable, and it really all starts with Dexter Lawrence. You know, he, he had an unbelievable game on Sunday. So, what what do you think about Dexter and this whole this defense so far through the first uh, five weeks? I love Dexter. And the fact that people last week were talking about maybe we should trade him, I was like, you're blasphemous. You're not a Giants fan. You can't give away our best player. I don't want to hear it. I don't care what we're getting back for him. You're not giving him away. Um, I He is so incredible to watch. And now, you know, Aaron Donald was always a good player, but now he's out of the league. Dexter Lawrence is the guy. He is the guy to be. He is getting double and triple teamed and still has six sacks in five games. It's like unheard of. So he needs to be an all pro this year. He needs to be a pro bowler. Like enough is enough. I understand he's on the Giants. You know, they're historically not a great team. Even if they don't win 10 games or whatever it is, he needs to be an all pro because his talent needs to be recognized by everyone. And I think it's starting the national media you know, is starting to really realize that five weeks in what he's done for this team. But, you know, it's interesting because the Giants defense is leading the league in sacks, which I think if you if you're watching the games week in and week out, you know, obviously the Browns game, they had eight and last week they have seven against the Seahawks. But it doesn't feel like they have that many at least for me. And I think part of that is because it's so spread out, you know, and I did a Q and a today. And one of my responses was, I love the fact that this defense is doing so well, but it's so, I find it so interesting that Jason Pinnock has a sack and Nacho and DJ Davidson and, you know, uh, Micah McFadden and all these different players on defense, which I love. It's great. But the expectation for me, especially going into this year was it's going to be Burns and Thibodeau who are going to be getting the sack. So um, I really feel like they're finally playing as a cohesive unit, which is really fun to watch because, you know, especially after last week, you feel like, all right, if they're not putting as much pressure on Gino, then you have the, you finally have some faith that Banks is going to make a play over on DK and DK is not going to destroy the game like he's done in other games. So 
I think part of it was learning a new defense. Part of it is this defense is very young, but I'm really happy with where they're at. And I feel like the improvement week after week has been really impressive. Like I said, I'm still disappointed. It's taken five weeks to get here, but um, but it's not week 17, so it could be worse. <laughs> it's well said. Um, you mentioned Deontay Banks and you know Johnny transitioning to defense there. Banks was called out by his position coach, Jerome Henderson, this past week saying, look, you got to play better, play like that first round pick. And that way you play your rookie season, you know, be aggressive with your hands, but don't, you know, commit penalties within five yards. I felt like at times he was giving up these easy slant routes for touchdowns, whether it was Lamb or Cooper or Jefferson in week one. I mean, last week, Banks really answered the bell. And those three passes defended really stuck out to me. I guess asking you, what was the biggest difference you saw in his performance? And can he carry that with him into the next week and so on? One of the complaints that I had going into the Seahawks game was I felt like it was glaringly obvious during the Browns game that he wasn't turning around to make a play on the ball. And, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to be a defensive expert when it comes to different positions, but when, you know, we've all watched a lot of football and when you watch these corners, the good corners in the league are having pass breakups or they're making interceptions or they're at least facing the ball so they can understand what's going on. And Banks, I really felt like was not doing that until this week. And maybe he watched extra film. Maybe it was more one-on-one -on -one time with Jerome Henderson. Maybe he just needed to get his head out of his butt. Like, I don't know what it was. It could have been all of those things. But maybe it was just the fact that Henderson called him out and he was like, oh, I can't get away with, you know, being lazy anymore. Um, but I feel like that was the biggest thing that I saw a difference on because when you're not watching the football and where it's coming, how are you going to break up the pass? How are you going to try and intercept it? Like you can't really make a great play on it, especially someone like him. It's only his second year in the league. You know, he's not a top five corner. I don't expect him to be good enough to not look at the ball and still be able to make a play. So, um, so I felt like that was a really big step for him. And, you know, the fact that he could do it against someone like DK is brings me some confidence. Am I concerned about him going against Chase and Higgins? A hundred percent. But I do feel like he's at least built up some confidence after last week to say, I can ride with DK, who's also one of the best in the league. You know, I should be able to, at the least, keep up with these guys. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it a lot. And um, that kind of segues into our keys to the game, Johnny. We're talking about it. And specifically, we don't know if Malik Neighbors is going to play this week. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, for me, and we could each give one or two each year uh, on keys we think that will put the Giants over Cincinnati, a starving team. Johnny and I were saying before we brought you up, Adriana, get Malik Neighbors the ball if he's playing. Uh, the Bengals' defense has allowed 10 touchdown passes this season, and we know all the rookie records he's set. We don't need to go over them super in-depth. But Neighbors did not play last week, and he still leads the NFL with most 20-yard catches, with most receptions. Uh, he's that good. Um, I'm just so impressed. Like, I've never seen a guy create this much separation or be this smart after the catch. Mm -hmm. The question is, can he stay healthy? Because we know – Daniel Jones has little to no care for his body. He's going to put his body on the line every single week. He's going to take hits when he should it. That's who he is. Mm -hmm. I don't want Malik Neighbors to get down that trend, but I also want Jones to have better ball placement as well. Yeah. So Neighbors isn't taking hits where Neighbors can step out of bounds instead of trying to run through two people, let's say. So that's, that's my key to the game. I mean, I really think getting Neighbors the ball – is most important, especially to the fact that he didn't play last week. You want to get him the ball right away so he can get his feet wet. He might be a little rusty being off for a week. I don't know. We'll see. It's the NFL, right? Crazier things have happened, Johnny. Yeah, I, I think a key for me, and uh, Adriano was bringing this up too, I, I think, and we brought it up too, I think if Singletary is going to play Sunday, I think him and uh, and Tracy both go 
combined for 100 yards. You know, this is a team in the, in the mm-hmm. Bengals that cannot stop the run. We said that with the Cowboys two weeks ago, and the Giants ran for like 27 yards. So I, I would love to see if they're playing, if they're both getting 50 percent each, go for a combined 100 yards. You know, also this this Bengals defense. I mean, they they can't stop the run. They can't get to the quarterback. So I mean, this this really, if you're looking at this, is kind of setting up in the Giants' favor. But I, you know, mm-hmm. talking, you know, Tom's talking about neighbors, and I'd love to see him get two. But I'd love to see the run, the rushing attack get, go for over 100 yards here on Sunday night. Yeah, I think this could be one of those games where they're very capable of doing that and to have back-to-back weeks where you have over 100 yards on the ground would be huge. Something that I want to see from this offense again is them continuing to spread the ball around. And I think part of the growth that we've seen in Jones, I think part of that is because of neighbors, but part of that is also not because of neighbors. The first couple of weeks, you know, you've you want neighbors to get all the targets, right? But at the same time, you don't want them to get killed. So, and also you finally have some other talent across the board on offense. Like I said, it's not Richie James and Kenny Galladay out there anymore. So I want to see them spread the ball around because if they're smart on defense, they're going to double team neighbors. Now, I don't think that's going to prevent neighbors from catching the ball or from making plays, but I do want them to get some sort of semblance of like a balance on offense where they can run the ball successfully and they can throw the ball successfully. And part of throwing the ball successfully means that everyone's involved. Theo Johnson, who is a big target, which is really helpful for Jones, you know, neighbors, obviously, who's a speedster and a beast. And then you've got Wandale in the slot and you've got Slayton for the long routes. And who knows, maybe Hyatt. But I just like the idea of them spreading the ball around because when you look at the Bengals, part of the reason why they have so much success is they have Higgins and Chase. So if you're double teaming one of those guys, you're leaving the other one open and they both can make a play. So obviously we don't have two of those guys. We don't have two neighbors, but the fact that we do have a Slayton, Wandale, Hyatt and Theo Johnson, and even Bellinger, like when he's involved sometimes here and there, to have that that semblance of a balance, I think is really key. And honestly, I think that's why Jones had such a good game last week was he couldn't force the ball to neighbors every single time. And he was forced to spread the ball around and it works. And I feel like it was a confidence boost for everyone. That's a great point too. And both of you guys have mentioned certain things where, look, the Bengals defense is not good. Uh, they're averaging, giving up 29 points per game I mean, Johnny Lamar chewed them up last week, uh, yeah. and that's why they lost the game, really. I mean, you could argue special teams, the whole – no. Lamar Jackson chewed them up. Um, they were unable to stop the run. They were without Sheldon Rankins, their best run-stopping DT, outside of B.J. Hill, a former giant, by the way. Of course. The revenge week. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, the B.J. Hill revenge game, yes. Yeah. But then to add to that, too, I think pressuring Joe – because you sacked Gino seven times last week. You lead the league in, st- in sacks. But, again, similar to the last two weeks, you're going up against young tackles. Marius Mims on the right side is a rookie. I know Thibodeau's out, but Brian Burns and Aziz Ojolari have to get there. Dexter Lawrence will get there, but the other two have to get there. Mm-hmm. Burrow has five or more passes of 40-plus yards this year. Adriana, to your point, targeting Chase, targeting Higgins, um, targeting the slot guy from Princeton. Um, that leads the league, those 40 plus yard passes, and you can't allow that to happen. Burrow leads the league in that, he leads the league in touchdown passes. So, we know he's playing better than ever this year. Um, he's playing like a top three quarterback right now, in my opinion. Unfortunately, he's playing on an awful football team this season, which begs me to ask both of you the question before we get into our players to watch. This is just so you're both aware, it's going to be a very, very, I think. Uh, a far-fetched question, but maybe it won't be after Sunday night's performance. And here it is. Should they at least consider it if they lose to the Giants? Because this is this is starting to get crazy here. Um, I don't think it's entirely his fault. I think the players just are not playing up to expectations, but we've seen this script one too many times. Last year, they got so far down the hole, and they couldn't come back from it, and it ruined their season, and they looked serviceable with Jake Browning out there. So um, I guess, Adriana, we'll start with you here and then Johnny. This is tough because part of me feels like 
you know, the Giants should be three and two. At the very least, they should be four and one, like the Bengals in similar situations, right? Like these teams, especially, well, depending on the week, the offense, they have been playing better than what their record shows. And unfortunately, they just can't close out games, both of these teams. But I, I don't know. I, if it's a blowout, Yes. Like if the Giants blow them out, then yes, they should, he should probably go. But I think if it's close and it comes down to a field goal, I don't know because I don't, is, I don't know if he has more experience as an offense or, or defensive coach, but after what happened with the Jets, I, I think it could be a possibility. Well, see, Tom, there's a key word though in that question it's consider. And the answer is yes. Mm. I mean, considering it, yes. Should they fire him? No. I'll tell you right now, he's not the biggest one on the hot seat this week. Uh, that, that goes to uh, Nick Sirianni in Philadelphia. I mean, if they don't beat the Browns on Sunday, if the Browns go down there and, uh, with the mess they've been and beat them, I think Sirianni should be gone mon next Monday. But if you think about it here, with the talent that the, the Bengals have on offense, I mean, the two-headed monster, and, you know, in the last couple of years – Look, Burrow has not been healthy at times. We know that. Burrow's looked healthy all year. I know he didn't have Chase at the start of the year. And when you don't have one of them, you essentially, if you don't have one of them, you basically don't have either of them. But now they're both there. Uh, consideration is definitely in play, yes. Now, should they fire him? No. I, I, I don't think so. The, the one saving grace that the Bengals have so far this year is they've only played one game in division. You know, last year when they got off to their bad start, they already were playing two divisional games and lost both of them. That's essentially putting yourself in a very, very early hole. So I say that there's definitely some consideration, but they should not fire him. I'm with you. I think it's more of an end of the season type of deal. I wanted to throw it out there, pick Burns oh, yeah. just to see. Um, but yeah, I think end of the season is probably more likely than than this right now. Um, yeah. And looking I mean, you at could their also, you could have also. You, I'm sorry, Tom. You said you could have also said that about Doug Peterson at Jacksonville if they if mm -hmm. they lost uh, Sunday, and I think he's at least saved a couple of weeks. And now they go, essentially, they go home for the next two weeks in London. Absolutely, and I, I think too, looking at three of their four losses: the Chiefs, the Ravens, the Commanders. All teams with at least three wins or more. Those aren't bad losses. Mm -hmm. You know, Washington is turning out to be a pretty good team this year. It's still early. They lost to the Patriots week one. That was a bad loss. All right. Every I think almost every team has one bad loss a year. Like loses a game they should not even be close to losing. Yeah. And we already saw that with Baltimore to the Raiders. Um, the Giants, I don't know if we've seen it yet, but uh, hopefully we don't. <laughs> I would say the Commanders, we've already seen it, I hope. Oh, true. Because true. that game, I will never forgive them for losing that game. No Just kicker. So yeah. bad. That's the one time you can't find table this year. Oh, awful. That's you're right. That, that is the one time I was like, "What the hell, Brian Dable? Like, why?" I, I know. Um, I guess they didn't think Jude was ready, but still, that's no excuse. I don't want to backtrack to three. To well, three four listen, if, you made feel, if you made us feel any better, you know what happened with the 49ers last week too. They didn't have a backup kicker, and look what happened there. Mm. Well, look at the way they played Washington. They played them well. They should have won. And Washington's in these games beating teams that we all thought might be better than them. Yeah. yeah so I mean, it speaks volumes about us, the Giants. I, mean, I think we're a better team than advertised. Right. And that's what I was saying at the start of the show, Adriana, was at the start of the um, – if you look at this year so far, they they looked awful against the Vikings, absolutely. But, you know, the Vikings are a 5-0 and team right now. Ever since then, every game they've played – They've been competitive, and with, mm -hmm. are they the most talented team? In let's just say in the NFC East, are they the most talented team? No, but I mean, I think Brian Dable's done the best job of any of the four coaches in the NFC East, considering you know the talent that they have and what they've been playing with so far. Yeah, I'm Dable has really pissed me off this season, but I do feel like. The, what we've seen from this team, especially in the last three weeks, like the way that they have kept games really closely and they've played well and they've battled and, you know, just come so short of winning. 
Um, I do feel like he does deserve a lot of credit for that. And especially what happened in Seattle, the fact that they didn't have a single false start. There were no awful penalties like there were some of the other weeks. It was more disciplined football. And I felt like they were well coached and well prepared, which week one, week two, week three didn't necessarily feel like that. Yeah, 100%. And uh, with that being said, before we get into our game predictions, let's each do one player to watch for each team on both sides of the ball. So two for each team, one on each side of the ball. Um, we will do uh, Cincinnati first. Adriana, we'll start with you, then go to Johnny, and then clockwise. Okay, predictions? Uh, so we'll do the players, and then we'll do the predictions after this. So okay, we'll the Bengals two players first. I, it's got to be Burrow because I think he's playing, you know, some of the best football that he's played in a while. And he's one of those guys that I don't think you can ever count out. But, you know, coming off an injury and stuff, you're never really so sure. And I feel like he's found that groove. Um, and I would pick Chase just because I, I'm a little bit worried about how the corners are going to be able to handle him, especially knowing that Thibodeau is going to be out. And, you know, I think Aziz is good. Um, they're probably going to elevate to him on Fox. He's okay. Um, but I'm a little worried that the defensive line, if they don't get home, that means the corners are going to have to do a lot of leg work this week. So that makes me a little nervous. Yeah, that, that's that's where I was going at with, on offense. Uh, Chase is the guy to me. I mean, I know Higgins is great, too, and obviously Joe Burrow, but it really all starts with Chase because that's one of the best connections because, you know, both of them went to LSU, so it's usually that's usually the case. The one player I'm going to watch on defense, and if you've been watching the Bengals this year, his name's come up a lot, and that's Cam Taylor Britt on defense. Uh, you, uh -huh. know, you know, he had an unbelievable interception in the Chief game a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, he's, he's somebody that could be a factor uh, on that defensive side for sure. Yeah, I know last week, really bad performance for him, allowing 93 receiving yards. They just placed Dax Hill on IR. DJ Turner has not looked good either. Um, yeah, they've all three of those guys have been hot or cold. For me, I'm going to go Trey Hendrickson. Bengals have the second least amount of sacks in the NFL, but Hendrickson's a guy that can wreck havoc. Uh, havoc. I'm excited to see him. He's got three of those six sacks. And then T. Higgins. I like T. Higgins a lot because Tay Banks, if he continues to play well, him and Chase, it could be a bit of a chess match. What's the Giants' biggest weakness? It's CB2. I mean, Cordell Flotts looked better. Adoree back healthier. You know, Drew Phillips is healthy in the slot. But which one of those guys can consistently match with T. Higgins? At least we know Banks is going to be on Chase more often than not. I don't know who's covering T. Higgins. And personally, I think that's a problem. That's a big problem. And he's only played in three games. His numbers are pretty good. He just He's averaging six catches per game. He's got two touchdowns on the year and nearly 200 yards. So for a guy who's only played three games, that is pretty impressive. So, yeah, that, those are my two for the Bengals. And now we'll go this way. Johnny, you give your two this way. <laughs> Johnny, give your two Giants ones, and then we'll go to Adrian. Uh, I'm – See, offensively, I'm going to the running back position. I'm looking. I'm I'm looking to see whether it's going to be one or both of them or 50-50. Again, I I think they both need to have a combined hundred yards here because the one of, one of the things I'm thinking about in this game is I don't want to get into a shootout with the Bengals because I think they will actually win that kind of game. I actually am looking for this to be kind of a lower scoring game, and I think what they need to do is like what they did on that opening drive. Uh, against the Seahawks, minus the fumble at the half-yard line, uh, is you know control the clock, keep that defense out there, and keep Burrow off the field. We say this a lot about great quarterbacks. The best way to neutralize a great quarterback is to keep them off the field. And if they can you know, run the ball against a very poor def run defense there in the Bengals, uh, I think that'll help. I, I think if they had a great running attack, they could have beaten the Cowboys two weeks ago, but we won't go back on that. So I'm looking at the running back position there. I think defensively, I, I mean, I think I'm going to put an obvious one out there. I think it's going to be Dexter Lawrence, especially with Thibodeau. And I think that actually is a pretty significant injury uh, in this matchup. I, I'm looking at, a, again, a bad offensive line that Joe, it's criminal that Joe Burrow has not been able to get an offensive line since he's been in Cincinnati. But I'm looking at Dexter Lawrence to once again maybe create, a, you know, create havoc again 
and maybe have another couple of sacks in this one. So I, I think we're going to look at the running back for the Giants, and I'm looking at uh, Lawrence on defense. Uh, for the offense, I'm going to pick Jones because I think that whether or not Neighbors is back, I think he needs to continue to spread the ball around and he's got to nail those deep throws again. And I feel like he's at the point where he has some confidence in himself that if he can take it one step further and build on that, we're going to see success from this offense. We saw it last week. And again, I think if they can just, if they can continue to build on it, I think that's going to be one of the reasons why we could win this game. Um I think that unless the defense – now, they've done a really good job of holding opponents to 28 points or less, but I think it's going to come down to either a Dory or um, – or, I mean, it's probably going to be a Dory or Flott and how they do against Higgins. Because if Banks does a really good job of shutting down Chase, which would be amazing, you're still leaving Higgins open. And, you know, if they have to use those two guys to double team him, then so be it. But, you know, we've seen better play out of both of them. But if, if they can't, you know, keep the two of those guys to 100 yards or less, I think we're in trouble. Uh, we all have our blunders once in a while. Uh, <laughs> talking without the mic on there. Um, yeah, look, for me, Giants-wise, offensively, I'm probably looking at – I'm a big tight end guy. It's my favorite position on, NFL, on an NFL roster. It always has been. Uh, Theo Johnson is my guy. Look, I love Bellinger too, but Bellinger is who he is at this point. He's a blocking tight end who can make a catch or two when they give him the ball. Uh, Theo Johnson was brought in to be a vertical threat. Um, he's got good hands. He's really good with his hips. And he's not an awful run run blocker either. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody about this in, in the past. His film at Penn State is not bad when you take a deep look into it. But, yeah, last week, five catches for 48 yards against the Seahawks. Impressive. And if tight ends are catching the ball on a Daniel Jones-led offense, that means he's got time to throw the football. They're not doing that naked bootleg rollout like they did in 22 where they throw to Bellinger or Myrick and get like five, six yards. They're not doing that. They're actually throwing vertical down the field now, which is good to see. And defensively, one thing we saw last week, um, Johnny and I were talking about this before, is the three safety look. So there was less of Micah McFadden and there was more of Dane Belton. So, in turn, I think that helps Deontay Banks out a lot. Uh, for me, I'm looking at Jason Pinnock. I want to see where he wants to line up on the defensive side of the ball. You know, he loves to flirt by the line of scrimmage the entire game. He's got three sacks for a safety. We're going to see Belt and freeloading a lot. And then we're going to see Tyler Newbitt making tackles in the backfield, run stopping. I want to see where Pinnock lines up because if we, if we see that three safety look, that allows Pinnock more freedom to move wherever he wants and if you want to stack the box. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking at Jason Pinnock on defense. A um, little bit two wild card players there, but I think they could have big factors in this game. Yeah. Quickly here, because I know we have New York baseball on tonight. I know uh, we want to get to that. Um, so we'll go to our game predictions here. Adriana, we will start with you. Um, quickly here, Mike Jasicki, Zach Moss did not practice today for the Bengals. Obviously, Kayvon Thibodeau did not practice for the Giants. Neither did Malik Neighbors. I know Singletary was doing some light stuff, but not much at all. So those are the key injuries as we go into Thursday morning. So we will get our game predictions at this time, Adrian, the Johnny, and then myself. Okay. I... I think the Giants can scrape out a win. I do think it's going to be close. Um, I am waiting for the day when the Giants are good enough to just blow people out and they're up by like 
10 or 14 in the last like four minutes of the game so I can relax and not be stressed the whole time. I don't think this is going to be it. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but I think that it could be like a 31, 27, 28 type of game. Um, I think the Giants could win it on a last minute field goal in their home stadium with Greg Joseph, who has done quite well kicking the ball. Um, I think it might be one of the times where the defense does well enough, but not enough to hold this team to 20 points or under. I just, I don't have enough confidence in them to do it yet, knowing some of the offensive stars that are on that team. Yeah, see, that's interesting because this is going to depend on what kind of game this becomes. Because if this is a, this becomes a shootout, I don't see the Giants winning a shootout game here because they don't play shootout football. And the Bengals are, you know, more, I think that the Bengals are more equipped to play shootout football. So if this game is going to be a higher scoring game, I'm, I'm going to take Cincinnati. But I actually – I have a weird feeling because it just – it has all the makings of being that. So I actually think this is going to be a, a little bit of a lower scoring one. And if that's the case, I got the Giants winning this game because I, I just don't think that they're equipped to play high scoring games. And obviously it would help to have neighbors in if that is indeed the case. But we don't know that yet. But I – one of the keys I said was I think we need to have 100 yards combined out of the running game. And what that will do is I think that will slow this game down and have fewer possessions, which will actually work in the Giants' favor here. So if you actually look at the last two meetings the Giants have played the Bengals, they've both been – the wins that they have have both been on the lower scoring side. Uh, it was 21-20 in 2016 and 19-17 in 2020. I'm not going to say it's going to be that, that lower, but – I think this is a lower scoring game. I'm going to go on the limb that this is going to be a lower scoring game because you know what? The way this league year has been, we can't figure this, this league year out to save our lives. So I'm going to go on the lower scoring side. And if that's the case, I think the Giants do win this game on Sunday night. So let's go with a 20, 20, 20 to 17 final. And I'm going to go with the Giants winning this game at home on Sunday night. Love it. So, by the way, Tom, this is going to be an Al, uh, uh, excuse me, a Mike Tirico, Chris Collinsworth, Melissa Stark special. Because, you know, that's one of my, that's my thing. Now it's a special. So, that's right. Uh, yeah. So, I'm going to go with the lower story side, side there. I don't know if I want to ruin the party here and go Cincinnati or stick with both of you go with the Giants. I, so for me, the Bengals have never won on the road at the Giants. I think if this game was in Cincinnati, oh, the Giants have played well on the road. That see that that's the thing. Yeah. Um, I've thought about it. I placed my pick before the show. Clean sweep is always uh, not great, but Giants win. Uh, final score. I'm going to go. This is going to be one of those weird ones. Uh, 24-23. Giants. Oh, nice. one point win. Yeah. One point win. So, but yeah, and that that's our show. Uh, Adriana, any final thoughts here before we um, let you go? We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, means a lot. Happy to chop it up with you, another yes. New York Giants fan. Hearing your story a little bit, I <laughs> definitely liked it. And picking your brain on on this football team, it's it's been great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I just, I am one of those fans that, you know, um, I do my best to be as optimistic as I can while, you know, understanding the realities of the injuries and things like that. And, you know, they're coming off a really great, tough win. I mean, I went into Seattle being like, I mean, <laughs> good luck, Giants. Like, I really didn't think that they we're going to look half as good as they did. Um, and the fact that they really dominated time of possession and they did well, I think the fact they're coming off that game is going to mean everything going into this game. Sunday night, prime time at home. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic than I was probably after, you know, the Dallas loss. <laughs> love it, love it. And um, why don't you plug yourself one more time for the folks at home if they're just tuning in now? 
So um, I am at New York Giants Fangirl on Instagram and TikTok. I post daily on both of those places. Um, and then at NYG Fangirl on Twitter. And then I have a podcast called Everything New York Giants. Um, and I am doing a Bengals preview tomorrow that should be up either tomorrow night or Friday. So um, I'll have a new episode coming out just in time for everyone to get ready for the weekend to tune in. Awesome. awesome. We'll Definitely check it out. Note of that. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time as always. Hope you enjoy the rest of your night and let's hope for a big W on Sunday and get back to 500. Yes. Let's hope so. Thanks Thank you guys so much. Go Giants. Thanks. Yes. Let's go big blue. Go big blue. That's right. Yes. That was Adriana, New York Giants fangirl. Johnny. We have one more thing to show here tonight, yeah. and it's the prediction from our friend Sam. I cannot be on the show this week, but still going to give some predictions for this upcoming game against the Bengals. Number one, um, just want to say Daniel looked very, very good. I know he was our player of the week. Just very, very proud of what I was seeing from him. Um, in terms of the upcoming game with the Bengals, I... The only concern I have is despite them losing fairly often this season, the Bengals can put a lot of points on the board. They are a shootout team. They go back and forth. We saw that last week with the Ravens. Um, and I just don't think that the Giants are going to be able to keep up with that. Um, so basically, I think the Giants will not be able to score enough points to beat the Bengals. I think that they're going to continue their good playing. Um, and I think the defense is really going to get a hold on Joe Burrow because of one of his injuries to his offensive line. Um, so, yeah, I unfortunately don't know if the Giants are going to win, but I was very, very excited to see the win um, with Seattle. And, yeah, uh, I'm going to say my score prediction is going to be 34 to 27. Oh, also Joe Burrow's hair. I was a fan of it when he buzzed it and bleached it, but now that it's growing out, he kind of looks like a Backstreet Boy. He's pulling it off because he is Joe Burrow, um, but I would love to see the original OG hair, all one color without the frosted tips. But Joey, if you're happy, keep doing you, buddy. <laughs> Joe Burrow's hair, I mean, that, that was funny. And I knew she – I played it because I knew she had Cincinnati, so that made me feel more comfortable taking the Giants because when it's a clean sweep for the Giants on this show, Ugh. hammer the opposing team's money line. But I'll tell you what, though, I, I agree with Sam not about Joe Burrow's uh, hair, but I will say I think the score, though, is, is pretty accurate on Cincinnati's side. Like I said, I think if the Bengals win this game, it's going to be on the higher scoring side because that's how they play. I think if the Giants win this game, it's going to be on the lower scoring side because I think they're going to control the, the, the time of possession. That's going to be a, a very interesting thing to watch on Sunday night for for sure. But you know, nevertheless, you know what the the one other thing you would want to watch, uh, you want to see with this is even if the Giants don't win this game, you know, show a lot of good signs because you know what I think that's really all you can ask for. I mean, it sucks that we have to, we'll be talking about moral victories, but the way that this roster is, I mean, I, and I said this to you at the start. Uh, and before we start here, I, I think Brian Dable's the, done a remarkable job. I know he had a very tough first two weeks, but given the roster and given the talent, I, he's done more with less than anybody else in this NFC East. I think he's the best. He's done the best job of coaching in the NFC East. I, I, I'm not taking away from what Dan Quinn's done there in Washington, but you know he's got an unbelievable quarterback play. He's got wide receivers and stuff. The Giants don't have don't have those kind of guys on the team, but I think Dable's done more with less than the other two coaches. You know, Mike McCarthy and Nick Sirianni have done less with more. And, you know, that's going to be something to watch. If the Browns go there and beat the Eagles on Sunday, you know, Nick Sirianni is going to be the next will be the next guy out of town. It's going to be that. If you want to check us out for more New York Giants content, feel free to check us out at Big Blue Avenue on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube for our video content. Uh, appreciate you all on behalf of Sam Cardona, Johnny Montalbano, my name is Tom Scavetta saying, saying so long. And without further ado, folks, let's go Big Blue.